Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of The Casual Criminalist. As always, I am your host, Simon. This uh, this show, what happens here, is Callum has put me together as scripts. I have in front of me right here, it's all about, there's a title on the last episode, there wasn't a title on my scripts. I had no idea what it was about, because I don't read these ahead, we go on a little adventure together. This one's called Napoleon Complex, the case of Oleg Sokolov, maybe being set in Russia, I would guess, with the name Oleg Sokolov. Callum writes it, I will read it for you right now. And uh, afterwards, Jen, our video producer, will add some memes and some sounds and some images. And let's just get into it. Just another day in Russia. At 5 a.m. on Saturday, the 9th of November, the St. Petersburg police received a phone call, which is probably all too common out in that part of the world. A drunk guy had fallen into the river like any university town. <laughs> the cops likely assumed it was just another routine alcoholic fishing expedition, but they were about to net themselves a far bigger catch than some clumsy drunkard. Officers arrived on the cobblestone banks of the Moika River to find a man struggling listlessly in the frigid water below. After dragging him out, they took him to the hospital for hypothermia. His hands and feet were frozen stiff and he was barely responsive. A quick ID check revealed that the catch of the day was Oleg Sokolov, an assistant professor of history at St. Petersburg State University. <laughs> wow, it's an adventure for the professor. To get an idea of what the professor was doing freezing in the Moya at 5 a.m., the cops took a look through the backpack he had been clutching onto. Inside, they made a shocking discovery. A pair of severed human arms cut off at the elbow. Oh, <laughs> this like taking the drunk guy who fell in the river to hospital just turned into like, this is a serious murder investigation. Le Complex de Napoleon. By all accounts, this Oleg Sokolov was an eccentric individual. A long-standing faculty member of the Department of History, he was well-liked among students for his fiery and passionate lectures. With his slightly unhinged delivery and hours spent learning about French military history, his specialist subject was far less dry than it ought to be. I always loved these professors. Like, you could... It, I really believe there's a good professor can take anything that is even boring and make it interesting. Like, I, I can't think of any specific now examples now, but definitely through, like, school and university. There were subjects that I found really boring. Just because the teacher was so good, you'd be like, this is great. I just enjoy this class. Over the course of a celebrated career of more than 30 years, he established himself as one of the leading scholars on Napoleonic studies. Professor Sokolov produced more than 100 academic pieces and landed several guest teaching spots at the Sorbonne in Paris. Then, in 2003, he received France's highest honor, the Légion d'Honneur, a medal established by his historical idol, Napoleon Bonaparte. For a lifelong fanboy of the French revolutionary turned dictator, that's about as good as it gets. Sokolov's obsession with French history went even further than the lecture room too. He was one of the most prominent battle reenactors in Europe. It's basically just like being in a real historical war with zero casualties and far less dysentery. I don't even know battle. I know like um, just from movies and TV shows and stuff like Civil War. Is it the Civil War reenactors? They do like these big battles in the US. I didn't realize it was like a, a thing in Europe. But here we are. In night, he just can't get enough Napoleon <laughs> or French history. He teaches about it. He play acts as it. He, uh, yeah. And, and somehow he's got someone's arms in his backpack. What is going on with you, dude? In 1976, he founded the first Society for Historic War Reenactments and went on to become president of the Federation of Military History Clubs of the USSR. More often than not, Napoleon's biggest superfan would be suited up as the man himself at their meetups, bawling out orders in fluent French. His performances and pedantic eye for accuracy won him invitations to events around Europe, so he became a familiar face at some of the biggest meets on the continent. In the wild, wild world of Napoleonic reenactments, our man was as big as they come and that i don't know it sounds like a very small pond does have a big deal in the napoleonic napoleonic reenactment community you might have heard of me the only problem was sokolov could never quite get out of character as author and prominence in petersburger lydia nevzorova put it he thought he could do anything and looked down on the world around him as if he really were napoleon okay i was just thinking like this guy teaches about napoleon he reenacts as napoleon he thinks he is napoleon Apparently so. Not only that, but he was also known for whipping out his impression of the historic commander during everyday conversations and regularly asked that his underlings in history community address him as sire. In other words, the man was absolutely insufferable. Yes, yeah, sounds like a very difficult man. An example of how much dictatorial power he held over his students and colleagues came in 2018. Oh, this is very recent history. Did we say that at the beginning? No, I don't think we did. 
Oh, in 2003, you received this honor. This is so recent. Wow. I, if for some reason this was occurring like in, in the past, in my mind. Partway through a lecture, a male student in the audience asked Sokolov about plagiarism allegations levied against him by a Moscow publicist. Instead of calmly denying the accusations, Sokolov went power mad. He ordered the other students to remove the dissident from his presence. <laughs> Intense. Video from the day shows him shouting, Get out! as some of the young guys in the audience seize their classmate and drag him outside. The young man was then guillotined to death in the university courtyard. Not really, but he did receive a stiff beating from his peers for daring to question the great emperor of the lecture hall. That is still pretty intense. Like They took him outside and they beat him. That's pretty much how I imagined academic freedom in Russia anyway, but it's crazy to see it on tape nonetheless. I mean, this was really recent. I met like USSR. <laughs> so intense. Despite his tyrannical leanings, uh, our 21st century Napoleon wasn't all about war. He also made time for love. His Josephine. As we all know, historians possess sexual magnetism in abundance, and it's the Napoleonic historians who get the most girls. Throughout his 19-year tenure in St. Petersburg, it was barely concealed. It was a barely concealed secret that Sokolov had a thing for chasing young women with considerable success. Wow, I kind of assumed Callum was being very sarcastic there. <laughs> It sounded very sarcastic, but no. Extended monologues on the intricacies of 19th century battle strategies just have that effect on the ladies. Anastasia Yeschenko first set her eyes upon Sokolov during one of his lectures. At the time, she was a promising undergraduate student of history, moved to St. Petersburg from Krasnodar in southern Russia. It's not clear what first drew her to the aging Napoleon wannabe, a married man almost four decades her senior, but regardless, when she was 21, the two began a relationship. Sokolov started calling her his Josephine, a reference to Napoleon's wife, dude. You're taking this too far, man. Please stop. He treated his young mistress to a whirlwind initiation to the world of academia, introducing her to colleagues and famous names in the field. To an aspiring historian at the start of her career, it must have seemed too good to be true. I mean, not really. You're just sleeping with the professor. <laughs> By the time she was a postgraduate in 2019, they had already been a couple for almost four years. Now they could afford to be less secretive on account of Sokolov's second divorce the year before. So Yeschenko, now 24 years old, to Sokolov 63, moved out of her university accommodation and into her lover's luxury flat on the Moika River. The two plans on getting married in 2020. Despite the age gap, they seemed a good match on the face of things. Yeschenko shared Sokolov's passion for French history and even co-authored some academic pieces with him. He introduced her, or maybe forced her, into the reenactment scene. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> and together they hosted balls and picnics where everyone dressed in period costume. Sounds like a laugh riot. I can only hope for everyone involved that old Oleg left his Napoleon act out of the bedroom. Or at the very least, dropped the bugles. <laughs> God. <laughs> Now, if you're feeling a bit off about the idea of a professor in his 60s leveraging his status to seduce someone barely out of high school, yeah, no sh**. I'm right there with you, thank you, Callum. As I mentioned, this wasn't the first time he'd done it. Anastasia Yeschenko was at least his second long-term Josephine. The pervy professor apparently made a regular habit of scanning the freshman lecture halls for any beautiful young women with brown hair. The more they looked like Napoleon's misses, the better. He would approach them after class and try his best to impress them with his academic credentials and hefty salary. <laughs> Okay then, mate. Although the university administration just chalked all of this up to the good professor's eccentricities, many of the young women saw it differently. Shocking. Uh, he racked up a fair number of complaints throughout the years for his inappropriate advances. The most shocking allegations saw one of his ex-partners go to the police. Ekaterina Ivanova was Josephine number one, who back in 2008 discovered that a new boyfriend was actually married with kids. H I how can you hide that? Like surely you're going to find out about that it's not like he's got some secret life going on he's a married professor at the university you know what his name is he's probably on facebook or like whatever russian facebook is probably facebook these days isn't it it's just facebook when she went back to break up with him at his flat he first acted acted calm and then he let it leapt on her in a fury he tied the terrified ekaterina to a chair beat her strangled her then threatened to scar her face with a hot iron dude how how did you not go to prison what is going on you beat up a woman you need to go to jail. So, of course, the police and university did absolutely nothing. Brilliant. <laughs> Everyone just treated it like an everyday lover's spat. Dude, tying someone to a chair, beating them, strangling them, and then threatening to scar them with a hot iron. It's not an everyday lover's spat. What is one wrong with you, university and police? It might sound mad, but that kind of impunity was a recurring theme throughout the megalomaniac professor's tenure. Not unlike his historic idol, Sokolov would start off as charming and benevolent before turning into a controlling tyrant, which brings us to the incident 
at the heart of the story. In the early hours of the 8th of November 2019, Anastasia Yashchenko called her brother. Her partner, Sokolov, had grown jealous when a friend invited her to a birthday party resulting in a vicious argument. Ah, yes. <laughs> Naturally, I get upset when she gets invited to go somewhere. You psycho. The old gentleman was worried about the idea of her attending a... Let's not call him a gentleman. <laughs> The old creepy man <laughs> was worried about the idea of her attending a normal modern party with younger, better-looking guys and not a petticoat in sight. Anastasia decided to, ta uh, to back down and agreed not to go. I first she planned on getting a bed at a hostel, hostel until Sokolov calmed down, but at around 1.30am she called her brother back to let, them to let him know that the two had made peace. If you're calling your brother when you have a fight with your boyfriend because you're scared of what the boyfriend might do, it's time to make an exit. That was the last time any of her family would hear her voice. Oh god, did she get killed? I just assumed they broke up. Oh no. Okay, yeah, you should have made an exit. Don't, I'm not saying, just in case there's any misconstruing things here, I'm not saying in any way that this is her fault. <laughs> I don't think I should need to explain that, but just in case. The Emperor's Downfall. The Arrest. Now this ain't no unsolved mysteries. There aren't any prizes for guessing who the arms in the black bag belong to. At the time Sokolov was found floundering around in the river, Anastasia was already dead. When the authorities searched Sokolov's apartment, they found her brutally dismembered torso in one of the bedrooms. A bloody hacksaw was sitting on the floor nearby, along with a gun, axe, and ammunition. A stun pistol was also tucked into the bag alongside the arms. It'd be a few days before the police recovered Anastasia's legs, which had been wrapped up separately and tossed in the river by which time Sokolov had fully recovered from his little swimming session, and he had quite a lot of explaining to do. Police now had CCTV footage of him walking the embankment on the river's edge and throwing several bags over a wall. The legs had apparently sunk to the riverbed as he intended, but no such luck with the arms. The professor panicked when he saw the second bag bob up to the surface. He went to retrieve it, but was so smashed that he ended up falling in completely. I feel like we got another pro tip for our... You know, it's like don't write down your crimes is always the classic one, but don't get drunk when disposing of a body. All right, pro tip there. Just like 200 years before, it was the chilly Russian weather which was Napoleon's undoing. Very clever, Callum. Sokolov was so cold and hammered that he couldn't get out of the river by himself, so just had to wait to be rescued, clutching his gory cargo. Dude, you should just let the cargo go. I mean, take the risk. They had caught him red-handed, but the motive for the murder was still a mystery. Sokolov was a known physical abuser, a crime which is often overlooked in Russia. And CCTV footage showed Anastasia running out on the freezing streets on the night of her death. She wasn't wearing a jacket despite the freezing temperature and was, ev and was evidently distressed. Was it possible that Sokolov had accidentally killed Anastasia in a rage? Well, to hear him tell it, it was all self-defense. Apparently, <laughs> dude, if it was self-defense, why'd you cut her body? <laughs> Please, no. Apparently, Anastasia became hysterical when he told her that he would have to spend time with his kids that weekend. During the shouting match, she rushed him with a knife, forcing him to protect himself by waiting until she was asleep and then shooting her in the head four times with a sawn-off hunting rifle. Seems proportionate, dude. You psycho. How can you make up? How can you make this up? Like, it's the modern day. There's TV. There's movies. You know you can't be like, she came at me and I shot her. And it's like, dude, the evidence clearly says that she was asleep in the bed and he shot her four times in the head. <laughs> it's like, this is going to unravel really fast, Professor. The post-mortem revealed the sheer malice of the act. The first shot to the face apparently failed to kill her, so Sokolov tried to strangle the young woman to death, breaking her neck in the process. What eventually finished the job with the three further shots to the skull, for which Sokolov had to reload multiple times. As you might have guessed, Anastasia's supposed knife attack most likely never happened. Thanks to the phone call, her brother was able to shed light on the real reason for their argument the old man's jealousy. According to the prosecution, while Anastasia was making that phone call, Sokolov was googling the spots along the moika where he could dump the body parts. What, are you just like googling where to dump a body? <laughs> Good locations for body dumping. Needs at least 4.8 on Google reviews. What? <laughs> also, I mean, Google searching things, I don't think it's quite as bad as writing down your crimes. But it's definitely, it's definitely on the list of bad things, of bad ideas. At any rate, if he really believed he was acting in self-defense, there's surely no way he would have done what followed. Perhaps to put on a performance of normalty, Sokolov decided to invite some friends around for a party that Friday night. The guests drank with him until the early morning, completely unaware that the corpse of a young student was locked away in the spare room. After all of his guests had left, he got to work with a hacksaw. Sokolov severed Anastasia's limbs and neck. He bagged up the arms and legs while leaving the head on the floor of the bedroom. After that, he went outside and tossed her phone into the moika river, then went about trying to throw her body pieces in as well, along with a stun gun which was conveniently absent 
from his self-defense narrative. Sokolov's plan was to do away with all of the pieces, then end his life as theatrically as he had lived it, by dressing up in his full Napoleon outfit and then killing himself outside of St. Petersburg, Peter and Paul Fortress. I'd like to think that it have used a naval cannon for an added bit of flap. But the bumbling emperor never got around to his grand exit. Under Turti, decided to give it a second crack later on. Flanked by officers in bulletproof fare, Sokolov was taken back to his apartment to take part in a very different kind of reenactment than he was used to. He was supposed to walk the police ste through every step of the killing. Once inside, he rushed to a cabinet full of antique knives, grabbed a dagger, and tried to stab himself. Again, no luck. The police restrained him before he could do any damage and took him back to jail safe and well. I mean, I, I don't know. Like, oh no, he killed himself. <laughs> Yeah, we really, really tried to stop him. <laughs> Just he ended up stabbing himself many times with that rusty antique knife. Oh no. I know, I know. He should be put on trial and there should be justice, blah, 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 blah. But I mean, it wouldn't have been the end of the world, would it? So in June 2020, the emperor was dragged in chains to the St. Petersburg city court. The prosecutors were pursuing a 15-year sentence. Why are you trying for prosecutors? Get a life sentence, come on! While Sokolov's defense team petitioned for half that amount. Acquittal was out of the question, bloody well hope so, since he had never denied his guilt, excepting that he had shot and dismembered his former lover. Sokolov put it before the judge, I killed her and myself too. I do not exist. My cherished memory of Anastasia is the most important thing for me now. But apparently, her memory wasn't worth all that much to him because he was willing to drag it through the dirt in the hope of a reduced sentence. Before the initial hearing, Sokolov's defense lawyer, Alexander Poichuyev, hinted at the plea of of temporary insanity brought on by alcohol, jealousy, and harassment from an academic rival. Oh, of course. Understandable. <laughs> yeah, he's been like, yeah, I was getting, getting some shit at work. So I went insane and killed my girlfriend, and now I'm fine again. It's like, no, that should not fly. Who among us hasn't killed and dismembered a lover because of a bit of work, stress, and vodka? <laughs> yes. In the end, though, they settled on self-defense. The argument went a bit like this. Sokolov admitted to the killing of his girlfriend, but added that, well, she deserved it. I mean, he obviously never used those words, but he might as well have. A hysterically weeping Sokolov told the court how Anastasia gradually turned into a beast from a scary fairy tale after they moved in together. The last straw was when she flew into maniacal rage that night. I've never seen such a stream of aggression, he said. No, Oleg? You don't think your own lost stream of aggression? Might have raised the bar just a little bit. Yeah, you shot her multiple times in the head where you had to reload in between, Oleg. Again, you psycho. <laughs> This kind of victim-blaming tactic is far more successful in Russian courts than you'd think husbands often get away with violence against their wives by claiming that they were hysterical or aggressive at the time, but thankfully, that was just a bit too much of a stretch in this instance. Four rifle blasts to the head could legally only be classed as self-defense if Anastasia was an actual T-500 Terminator. An <laughs> Very nice. An analysis revealed that she was in fact not a robotic menace from the future, so on Christmas Day 2020, Oleg Sokolov was convicted of intentional murder and weapons possession and sentenced to 12 and a half years behind bars which in my opinion is still still too little that's still too little wrap up that concludes the story of the rise and fall of one of st petersburg's strangest murderers a man who held so much power over his own little world that he thought of himself as mighty as napoleon himself but how was he allowed to exert his wicked will on his students for so many years before finally being toppled a petition was launched after the murder demanding answers from the university they simply denied any complaints that have been made against the senior lecturer and buried their heads in the sand isn't that going to be a bit different when people are going to be like no 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 he was weird I lodged complaints against this weirdo. In fact, every organization he was involved with scrambled to scrub his name from their websites, preferring to pretend Sokolov never existed at all. Because really, plenty of people knew what he was doing over the years and what he was capable of, like a Russian Weinstein in a silly admiral's outfit. Unfortunately, the tragic end of Anastasia's story is all too common in Russia. Some estimates put the domestic violence rate at one every 40 minutes. In recent years, relaxed sentences for domestic violence and increased ones for false reporting, which might well be used to deter genuine reports suggest things might only get worse from here that is terrible it shouldn't be like that the challenge for women's advocates in russia is to root out people like sokolov before they end up as killers and demand the system tip the scales back in favor of the victims it's a tough fight but it's a worthy one for sure viva la revolution dismembered appendices while awaiting trial in prison, Sokolov spent his free time writing a novel, offering the prison guards a 50% cut if they gave him a computer, which they did not. So what was it about? His secondary specialist subject, love. Thankfully, the book cannot be published without the consent of the victim's family, meaning it will probably never see the light of day. Good. 
and I like to think that it's crap. Number two. Early on, I mentioned a that historic battle reenactments have zero casualties, but that's not always the case. Yeah, there's going to be accidents, right? People are going to forget to like unload a rifle that they actually fired or something crazy, or they're going to stab someone in like a play fight. In 1982, Sokolov was involved in another investigation into the death of a reenactment club member. Oh wow, but one that actually involved this dude? No, Sokolov didn't flip and bayonet an English man to death. He and others were actually just sentenced to two years of probation for criminal negligence when a frigate ship sank while preparing for a film shoot, killing the teenager. Well, that's a dark note to end on. This has been an episode of The Casual Criminalist, where things tend to be rather dark. I've been your host, Simon. Thank you to Callum for putting it together. Thank you to Jen for adding the music and such afterwards. I really hope you enjoy this show. If you did, if you're watching on YouTube, why not give it a like? If you're on, uh, if you're listening to it as a podcast and you can leave us a review, that would be fantastic. Tell a friend. Tell a friend. That's a good one. Have you heard of The Casual Criminalist? It's a show about crime. Ah, there's that. And thank you for watching.